Revelation 22. Here we go. Genesis 13, 5. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. See, this really is the story of the Bible. How it begins and how it will end. The seed or the offspring of the woman will eventually overcome the seed of the serpent. So who is the seed of the serpent that would be overcome? And maybe I should ask, who's the seed of the woman who would overcome? Might sound like a silly question. I mean, virtually everybody will say that the seed of the woman is clearly speaking of Christ. He is the seed of the woman who would bruise the head of the serpent. And I agree with that. But I think there's a little more there. You see, I don't think it's too far out of this world to suggest that Eve represents those in covenant with God, or at least the covenant line of God's people through which the covenant would continue. It kind of makes sense. I mean, Jesus was, you could say, her ancestral line, and, and he brought a new covenant, right? And after all, Galatians tells us that Sarah and Hagar, uh, they were symbolic of two covenants. Sarah, representing the new covenant, the new Jerusalem from above, which is interesting, I thought. It's called the mother of us all. Galatians 4, 24 through 26. So again, I think it's a reasonable thing to say. I would likewise suggest that the serpent in the garden... Rather than being a physical, slithering, literally talking snake, might be representing something or representative of something. Perhaps a foreshadow or, or typological of what we see later on in the story. Perhaps something related to Gog and Magog. Hmm. Hint, hint. Well, let's do that. Let's fast forward in the story and see if this serpent raises his head again. Let's go to Deuteronomy. As they are about to enter the land, Moses said, speaking to God's covenant people, those who had entered into covenant with Yahweh, he says in Deuteronomy 31, 29, and evil will befall you in the latter days because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord and provoke him to anger through the work of your hands. And this is said many, many, many times over by Moses and in Deuteronomy. Uh, it really becomes thematic. Then he goes on to go into great detail about their latter end, their last days, their ultimate destruction. Notice this. I want you to notice how Moses describes these people, that, that generation really. Here's what he says. Deuteronomy 32-33 their wine is the poison of serpents and the cruel venom of cobras. It's like he's saying that that final generation, they're going to be so full of corruption and they're going to be so unfaithful, their mouths are going to be dripping, just dripping with lies and deceit and hatred and blasphemy. It will be like poison. That final generation. Man, isn't that intriguing? Um, and, 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 you know, I think it's actually really fascinating. As we come to the New Testament, and we see John the baptizer, and he's, he's approaching who? The Jewish leaders. They were part of that final generation of unbelieving Jews, that religious system. Those that we know from the biblical record rejected Christ. And how does John address them? <laughs> Matthew 3, 7, brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Brood of vipers. More literally, he's really calling them offspring, seed perhaps, offspring or children of poisonous serpents. Well, that sounds like Deuteronomy 32, 33 that I just read. Now, doesn't it? Uh, let me just be more blunt. John is saying this. He's saying, hey, you know that serpent in the garden? Uh, you know those, those people with, with venom on their lips that Moses talked about? You know that serpent? He's your daddy. That's him. You're just following in his footsteps. You're, you're following lockstep with Moses, what Moses said of you. 
Think about that. And get this, I think it's even more telling how Jesus himself, he said virtually the same thing, but he says this in Matthew 23, 33. Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Man, that's interesting. Jesus uses serpents and vipers, again, when vipers refers to poisonous or venomous stinks specifically, just like Moses referred to in 30, Deuteronomy 32, 33. Isn't that fascinating? I think so. And if that's not enough for you, remember what Jesus told the Jewish leaders or what he called them specifically in John 8, 44. He said, you are of your father, the devil. And the desires of your father, you want to do. So the devil, which basically means slanderer or accuser, I think slanderer would be more accurate. The slanderer, the devil, was their father. And that would make them the offspring or the seed, really, of the devil, of Satan. They are the offspring of the serpent. Now, you know, I'm starting to wonder you know, if this seed or this offspring of the serpent predicted in Genesis 3 just might be right here under our noses here in the New Testament, because it seems to me that these Jews, they stand against Jesus. They are adversarial. They are adversaries to the kingdom that he has come to establish. Now, wait a minute. They were the adversary, right? They needed to be defeated, right? Romans 16.20. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. Now, if you've watched this series, you know that the Greek word Satan or Satan, what does it mean? Yeah, you know what it means. It means adversary. Hmm. What adversary, what Satan would soon be crushed under the church's feet? Or let me just lead you down the obvious by asking, what adversary of God, what Satan, would soon be crushed under the church's feet via or by the means of the Roman Empire? Sounds like a battle's going on here, right? Well, there was. There was a spiritual battle going on, and the church would soon, as Paul says, emerge victorious. And when we finally do get to this battle, the end of the story, who do we see? Well, by golly, we see the same thing that we see in Genesis chapter 3. Revelation 22, the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil, and Satan. <laughs> now, it's my contention that this serpent, this Satan, this devil, this apostate Israel and Gog are one and the same. You see, the arrival of Jesus, his ministry, uh, the death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and the church's spiritual warfare uh, during that transition period essentially bound the adversary for a time while they fought, and they overwhelmed that adversarial Jewish apostate system in the last days. You see, the gospel message, it could not, it was not thwarted, and it was not, uh, it, and it was not thwarted, because the Great Commission, I believe, uh, Matthew nineteen twenty-eight, I think, as we like to call it, that was accomplished. The gospel was preached throughout the world, I believe, around the, by the mid-60s. Colossians 1.23, the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, Paul says at that time. Cross-reference Mark 16.15. See, I believe this was the case um, just about the time that this serpent, this Satan, this adversary was, or this devil was released for a little while, as we see in Revelation 20. Now, I think that was in the early 60s, meaning, here's what I think this is really getting at, that the Judaizers, or the, the Jewish uh, zealots, uh, their cause seemed to, to gain power, seemed to gain momentum, uh, as many of the apostles were imprisoned, and then they were killed off, and that allowed not only their persecution against the church to increase, but they were leading the charge by deceiving many, uh, convincing the Jews to rise up against Rome, and that led to an all-out zealot-led war against Rome, and that actually resulted in their own destruction. 
And this was actually kind of a seemingly a dark period for the church. Lots of persecution, lots of death. Um, <clears throat> The great Neuronic uh, persecution was just on the, the, the fringe of happening between 64 and 66 AD. But again, I do believe it was around this time that the Satan, the adversary, was loose for a little while, as described as Revelation 20. And, and I only mention this as an example uh, of many verses that make sense if, they make sense if we understand the historical situation of the New Testament time period, and in addition to that, if we can just try for a second, please try with me, uh, to take off our traditional lenses, take off those glasses that we've been trained to look through and, you know, taught about Satan. Put away the notion of a, you know, spiritual evil super being with horns, you know, and, he, and he's being released from some sort of a spiritual prison and he's going around, you know, wreaking havoc uh, on individuals through, you know, mind game manipulation. Um, instead of that, instead of that picture, uh, recognize that the true Satan, the true Satan, the true adversary, the true devil, um, the enemy, uh, at that time that they were battling, that was Old Covenant apostate Israel. You know, if we can do that personally, I think that makes so much more sense of, of, of verses you know, that we, we look at, it makes it so much more clear and meaningful. For example, 1 Peter 1, 5 and 6. He says, be sober, be, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, the devil, he walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing it, that knowing the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Now, I want you to think about the historical context here. You know, so this is sometime around 62, 63 AD, the onslaught of persecution by the Jews, the impending neuronic persecution. Now, remember, who did Jesus say the Jewish leaders, uh, was the Jewish leader's father? The devil. Yeah, the devil walks around, walks about like a roaring lion. Okay, look. I'm not trying to be cryptic here. I'm trying to be clear. But in case you're not picking up what I'm laying down here, let me just cut it to you straight. That final generation of Jews that had become apostate, Old Covenant Israel, they were the long prophesied Gog. Let me just kind of give you a quick 30 second summary, see if this makes sense. The original serpent in the garden equals the serpents and the cobras that Moses spoke of in Deuteronomy 31, which equals the final perverse crooked generation of Jews that would come to their end that Moses spoke of in Deuteronomy 32, which equals the snakes and vipers, the Jewish leaders we see in the New Testament that both John and Jesus lambasted which equals the Satan, Satan, soon to be crushed in Paul's day, which equals the serpent in Revelation, described as the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, which equals the last adversary, the last enemy to be defeated or destroyed in the latter days, which equals the Gog and Magog of Revelation 20 and Ezekiel 38. You know, doesn't it just make sense, I mean, if you think about it, that the very, the very first adversary, you know, and, and really the death that was associated with the adversary, the very first adversary presented at the beginning of scriptures, the very first, is the very same enemy, the very same adversary that's defeated in the last day's battle, Gog in Magog. Doesn't that stand a reason? Isn't that reasonable? Okay, 
Now that I've kind of left myself vulnerable by going out on a limb here, <laughs> by sharing my conclusions, um, I hope that you will join me in my next video. Because uh, again, we're going to go through chapter 38, 39, and uh, we're going to uh, go through the text, look at specific verses. And I promise you that as we go through those with our newfound, you know, Gog identity lenses on, uh, I think it's only going to uh, continue to verify and solidify what I've been saying from the outset, that the the only last days in Scripture, taught in Scripture, are the last days of Old Covenant Israel. And apostate Israel is indeed the long prophesied Gog to be defeated in the last days. The final battle has been won, my friend. Uh, God and God's people won. The last days are past days is what I'm telling you. All right, I'm out of here. That's all I have for you. I uh, hope I didn't blow your mind too much. So, hey, thanks for joining me. We'll uh, catch you next round and uh, take care of y'all. Uh, appreciate you watching. Bye-bye.